So uh, I do want to uh, remind you before we get started that all of the presentations that we do here at the specialty workshop is available on our website. And so if you go to the Solar Car Challenge website, if you go to workshops on the bottom of that, there's uh, a, well, there's, it's in two places. There's one at the bottom of, this, of the page that says workshop presentations. And also, within the agenda, there are links to each of the PowerPoint presentations. So um, feel free to continue to take pictures of, uh, of the screen if you desire. Uh, but you do have the source material as well uh, that's available to you. And it's also on the YouTube channel. So, so all the, all, all the uh, information is available to you. So if you know of uh, kids who were not able to attend the specialty workshop here live in person, and they weren't able to listen to the webcast live, uh, all of this will be recorded. And after some days of processing, we will upload it. Uh, you'll also note that in our webcast page, there's a link to the 2018 specialty workshop and all of those things are recorded there as well. So just wanted to let you know that. So now we're gonna transition from going uh, and building the mechanical side of your car towards the electrical side. So um, let's, let's go into details on that. Okay, so we wanna talk about how you get the car moving with the solar array, power trackers, and motors and controllers. Okay, so uh, let's talk first about the shape of the array. As you've seen in some of the cars that I've shown in, in the slide deck, a lot of the a common selection is a flat solar array. Um, typically what we call ring over body, where you have a flat array on top of the car and you have your, uh, your solar car frame underneath of it. Um, a lot of people like doing that because you essentially maximize the uh, collection surface, right? If you have your array on top of your body, you don't have to have a cutout for your driver so you don't lose space there. You also have it um, angled in a way that, it, you know, it, if it's flat, uh, when the sun is overhead, you get a maximum collection. So um, it, it, it's, it's definitely uh, more optimal in, in that type of arena. However, if you start looking at some of these advanced cars, um, because of the body shape of the car, uh, you may have solar panels that are split up into different pieces and that's sort of put on the, on the surface of the body of the car. And because of that, because of the aerodynamics, you end up getting a curved shape. Now that's, uh, they do this primarily for aerodynamics, right? They, they, you want to uh, be able to um, get the most efficient use of the energy that you have so you shape it in, in a way. We'll talk about aerodynamics later today. But they do that primarily for aerodynamics, but uh, you do have to deal with the angle of the sun. So if you understand how solar cells are put together, they are, tend to be put in series. Put, having things in series means that you connect the positive to the negative, to positive to negative, to form one whole string. And what happens is that you boost the voltage of that string. So uh, if you had, let's say, 10 solar cells wired in series, and each solar cell is typically about half a volt, wiring them in series would be five volts. The interesting part of that is if a solar cell produces three amps, your string of solar cells will also produce three amps. Now the thing you have to remember about that is that means that if you shade any part of your solar cell, any one solar cell, it will take the current draw or it will produce the same current as every other 
cell in the string. So if I covered half of a solar cell in one string, I would get one and a half amps instead of three amps over the entire series of 10 cells wired in series. So you just by shading one cell, you are cutting your power output for that entire string. That's what you do when you wire things in series. So how this applies to your choice of solar array shape is that you know if you don't aim your solar cells straight at the sun, you will get less energy production. Right? The, uh, the more angle of, of, of the sun was straight up top, you get the maximum. And then as the sun moves and you, and you have this angle, you will produce less and less energy. You should be testing that out in your solar array so you know what the performance is like. And we'll talk more about that in the power management section to come later today. But in this sense, your curved solar rays, because they're curved in different angles, that will affect your solar production. And if you were to put, let's say, a curved solar ray horizontally this way, and if you wire those uh, panels together in series, you will always get worse performance because if the sun comes this way, this side of your panels will get great production but your other side will not. And so even though you're getting maximum production on that one side, you're limited by the other side. So what teams tend to do in a curved solar array is to split up into multiple zones where the, the cells on one side of the car are connected to one power tracker, and the cells on the other side of the car is connected to another power tracker, and they're wired in parallel. And so then you, you don't have those two zones affect one another. OK, now let's talk about the types of solar cells that you might put on your car. The choices you have are pre-made panels. These are panels used primarily for uh, residential construction or you know, uh, basically co residential or commercial construction. You might see a lot of these uh, in parking lots and, and things like that now, or on top of homes and on roofs. And the, the nice thing about these are um, they have this frame that's on them, and they have a nice solid um, glass that's on top of that. And so uh, for the most part, they're somewhat indestructible. Not completely indestructible, but somewhat indestructible in the sense that you know, they're designed to even get rain, hail, sleet, snow on them uh, without issue. And so um, they're, they're nice and reliable. Uh, however, that comes at a cost of your weight. Right? Uh, we were having a discussion earlier today about this co the savings of weight if we were to move from a prefabricated panel to something that's custom made for a solar car. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a sec. Um, the other benefit of pre-made panels is they are very um, cost effective. Uh, you can buy pre-made solar panels at a much cheaper cost than anything you would get custom for a solar car. And so entry-level teams tend to go this route. And if you talk to some solar distributors that are in your community, they can probably find you some in a back warehouse and say, uh, give it to you for a discount or give it to you for free. Um, so definitely you can engage people on that. They're, they're a lot more readily available. There's some sources for you there. Okay, now moving on to what I call custom or uh, there are some pre-made or custom lightweight options. Uh, you heard Joel talk about this company, SBM Solar. Uh, they will essentially help uh, they, they provide uh, some pre-made options, or you can work with them to build custom panels and custom panels of the of the size that you want. And so you can you can talk to them and say, "Hey, I'm interested in sun powered 21% cells or 19% cells. 
um, I want them encapsulated, uh, which means you protect them from weather and, and, and connectivity and all that stuff um, in, in a piece of essentially plastic. Um, and, and it provides some level of structure. Um, they actually do a surface that actually tries to uh, magnify the sun uh, uh, landing on those cells through the uh, through little prisms and things like that to try to to try to increase the production of energy on those cells. But the the nice thing is they will custom make uh, panels for you uh, that uh, fit your car, right? So if you design a car that, uh, and you didn't think of the solar panels as part of that design, you can then go and say, oh, I need panels of this size. I need uh, one panel that's four by five cells. I need another 10 panels that's two by three because I might want some narrow panels. And they will make them for you. Uh, and it's not horribly expensive to do that. So uh, the benefit to those is that they're very lightweight. You don't have the nice metal framing around it. You don't have a really thick um, glass that protects you from uh, hair and, and, and all that stuff, which you don't really need on a solar car application. Right? We, we really will not be driving our solar cars in hail. Um, and so uh, that's certainly uh, something uh, to consider as options. Um, <clears throat> the final option is uh, doing it yourself. Um, way back in 1997, when I started racing here, um, I did this. We actually bought a stack of solar cells, made a jig, and, and there'll be pictures on, on the process uh, coming up. Um, however, it takes a lot of time and effort to put your own solar panels together. Um, we always say that you plan to have breakage uh, on the order of maybe 25% of your cells may get broken if you try to wire this yourself because the solar cells are so brittle that any amount of pressure that you put on there, uh, they'll just crack and then now you got to toss it away. Okay. Uh, however, you know, this is a way to save some money and uh, learn about solar cells and you can custom make it based off your application. I would have said that it would be very difficult to get cells now and, and it, it is more difficult to buy raw cells now than it used to be but uh, Joe had shared yesterday that he was able to to get some uh, from some sun power distributor or something like that to, and they might work with schools so uh, it's definitely uh, an option. I will warn you, uh, like, a, like the first bullet says, if you're considering putting a solar array together for a car this summer, you are too late. Uh, it's just there's not enough time to do it, test it, and make sure it all works properly. So uh, if you're considering doing that, definitely it's a, it's a long-term project. But it's a, something that's definitely uh, uh, a, a worthwhile lesson to learn. I've got to add one thing here because when you say something like that, it tends to throw out a challenge of well, can we do it? Can we be the ones to do it? We actually had a group who decided that they were going to try to. Um, the reference down at the bottom is a, another option that you have where uh, Suncat Solar and Alan Chuzel, uh, who's uh, who heads that up, um, they are much like SBM Solar where they can make you custom panels with high efficiency cells so that you don't have to put together your own solar array. I will say that uh, SBM Solar has uh, a better cost but Alan Chazelle was always able to get the highest efficiency uh, cells that are out there. So that's the trade-off. Any classic division car won't matter because the cells that he can get 
bring you above the classic division rules anyway. So you're talking about you know, advanced division cars here. Okay, so uh, these are the types of things. Uh, I, I think this is also from uh, Suncat Solar. Uh, uh, that those cells and, and so are, are these. So those are the type of custom cells that, that you can get. SPM Solar can do similar things. Um, so we, we, we talked about uh, this already. Um, so here is the do-it-yourself. This, this is the technique. You essentially make a jig that uh, fits your solar cells in the right spacing. You have to then solder essentially uh, bus bars on your solar cells from the top to the bottom, top to the bottom, and so on down the road. So you actually have to keep flipping your solar cells back and forth, and that's really the source of breakage. And you can imagine for a solar array like this how long it takes to put together. Um, so that's why we say it, it, it's a consideration. I would not recommend uh, doing it. Uh, the, the, the Mark Westlake, the advisor of the Minnesota team here, uh, who had to do this, said, if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't do it again. Just go out and buy one. And there's, there's so many things to do in solar car projects. This is not a, a, a place that I would spend time uh, learning and, and, and playing around with. So you can tell the breakage, and then you have to break it and then re rewire it. I had a, a team of electrical engineers from the university at a local factory give us the floor, and we made a number of these with the students doing soldering with their jigs and their laminator and everything. And we made good panels and we made bad panels. It's not recommended. Uh, everything has to be clean. And the thing and yep. Okay, now let's talk about power trackers or MPPTs. MPPT stands for Maximum Point Power Tracker. Uh, the idea of that is the power tracker will go and find a point in the solar cell production that maximizes current and, and voltage to maximize the power produced. That's why it's called a maximum point power tracker. And then there are DC-DC converters. So a maximum point power tracker will try to find the maximum point uh, where you can produce uh, for the solar cell. A DC-DC converter essentially says whatever the, uh, the solar panel produces, it's going to convert it down into a specific voltage level for charging your battery. So that's the difference between the two. Um, the, the top uh, three and the bottom one are example companies for maximum point power trackers. Uh, let me talk about uh, a bit of the ones that I know about. Um, AERL is a very common power tracker used for high voltage applications. They're really the only one nowadays, it used to be there are other companies, that support conversion of voltages beyond 48 volts. Um, so if you have a 72 and 84 and 96 volt uh, car, meaning that your system, your batteries run at that voltage, um, you will be looking at buying an AERL power tracker if you're looking for power trackers. Um, Outback is something that uh, I'm familiar with. They're a little larger in size. They're, they're a tank. They basically uh, are very reliable, and they convert uh, up to 48. I'm sure they can go a little higher than that, but spec-wise, it goes up to 48 to, uh, volts. And then uh, Jenison is a a power tracker that uh, the Walnut team has used uh, in the past uh, compared to the Outback, which is uh, about very big. A Jenison is about that big and fairly small uh, in terms of installation. Um, and it was uh, made by uh, someone uh, at MIT uh, who had done this as part of a, a graduate project and, and commercialized uh, that product. Um, either way, all of these uh, 
maximum point power tracker, the whole idea is you do not need to match the voltage of your solar array to the, uh, the voltage of your batteries. You essentially just go and put your uh, solar array through a power tracker. The power tracker will do the conversions for you. It will detect the voltage of the battery, provide just a little voltage above that so that you can get current into uh, the batteries. And then the, then the batteries will get a maximum current charge uh, from the solar array. And that's what you use the power tracker for. Okay? So this is an example of uh, ARL power trackers. They look like a circuit board with a whole bunch of transformers on them. Uh, in this particular uh, case, you have essentially three power trackers, which means that in their solar array, they divided their solar array into three zones, and they run it each through one of the power trackers, and then they're connected in parallel to the batteries. Um, you'll see that there are some pretty thick cables coming out of there. That's the plug that plugs into the circuit card connecting to the batteries. Okay, so um, a, a little, sorry, go ahead. It's, it's, you use an MPPT or a DC-DC converter. Uh, DC-DC converter essentially says, I'm just gonna change one voltage to another voltage, uh, regardless of what the battery state is, regardless of what your array input is. It just says, I'm gonna transform the voltage. In a maximum point power tracker, it's essentially a smart DC-DC converter that is able to detect the voltage of your batteries and then uh, maximize the uh, power input both from the solar cells itself and then also uh, based off of your battery or try to get the right voltage so that you can maximize the amount of current that gets driven into it. If we had a sponsor from the old Indiana team, he would recommend that you don't use a DC-DC converter because it's when you either connect it or disconnect it. You're in the likelihood for a pretty good spark. So that's why MTPTs are so much better, much safer for your DVDs. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, taking a little aside to talk about uh, the low voltage indicator, our rules require you that for your supplemental batteries, you must have a low voltage indicator that is an audible. Uh, you know, uh, device that will warn you, alarm you when the supplemental batteries are low. And the reason why we do that is that a lot of the safety equipment in the car is attached to your supplemental batteries. Your driver ventilation fan, your, uh, your battery ventilation fan, your turn signals, brake lights, horn are all attached to your supplemental battery. And so, um, we say that if your supplemental battery voltage is low, uh, you'll need to go out and take care of that. And so um, this is a way to do the low voltage indicator. In the sources presentation yesterday, uh, you would see other low voltage indicator solutions. Okay, so we've taken now power from your solar array. You've brought it in through a power tracker to charge your batteries. Now, how do you use that energy? You, you, we're gonna now talk about driving the car via the motors. You have multiple options here. Um, you can use what's called a brushed electric motor, or you can use a brushless electric motor, and then we'll talk about hub motors next. Uh, brushed electric motors are sort of the very uh, basic, simple uh, electric motor. A brush motor tends to have two terminals, just a positive and negative, and it's a DC-driven uh, motor. Um, it is uh, essentially very inexpensive to get. You're talking about on the order of like $300, I think, is, is the order of magnitude. Um, but for that cost, you get lower efficiency, and you're talking about the 
80s to maybe upper 80s percent efficiency if you run it in the right efficiency band. And uh, let me take an aside to talk about the right efficiency band. In every motor, there is a specific RPM rating that the motor is designed to run at. So if you see the ratings like this motor is 88% efficient, it is only 88% efficient at the RPM that you are supposed to run at. The problem is that most teams, when they're designing a car, say, I want to run at 40 miles per hour, I want to run at 30 miles per hour, when they're not really going to be running at that speed. And they gear it that way, so that when they run their car and it actually runs at 15 miles per hour, the motor RPM is a lot lower than what the motor is designed to run at. And so we ask you to take time to test to see how much power it takes to run at particular speeds and find gearing that makes sure that the motor runs at the RPM that it's meant to be run at for the maximum efficiency. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but brush motors have lower overall efficiency. Um, but the controller is very inexpensive as well, so you need a controller to drive the motor, and that controller's role is to say when you uh, apply throttle, the motor, can, uh, the motor controller can moderate the amount of energy that gets sent to the motor, and, uh, and so uh, that's its role in the whole sequence. So essentially, you connect your batteries to the motor controller, and you connect the motor controller to the motor. And why it's easy to wire is it's just two wires, positive and negative, very easy to do. Okay, a brushless uh, electric motor is more efficient than a brushed motor. Uh, brushless and brush just mean uh, the, the coils that are inside of the motor, the magnetic coils are, are brushed or not, and it, brushless has less friction in the way it's coiled. It is a bit more expensive, it's not horribly more expensive. I think uh, it's on the order of maybe $800 or something like that to that effect um, for the cost. And then the controller is slightly more uh, difficult to wire. It's not horribly more uh, difficult to, to wire. It's essentially a three-phase motor rather than a simple positive and negative. So you'll have three outputs instead of two to wire. It's not too hard. Uh, some examples for you. Um, the top three are very, fairly popular brush motor examples. The Briggs & Stratton E-Tech motor. Uh, Briggs & Stratton d does not produce this motor anymore, but I bet you will find this motor available in many, many uh, places still being sold, including robotics. It's a very popular motor in robotics, and so you'll see um, <coughs> E-Tech motors there. Uh, Lynch or PMG-132 are, are perfectly fine uh, replacements for that. They all look pretty much like this. We call them pancake motors in this way, and they're, they're fairly efficient. Um, this is the controller that most people tend to use for a brush motor application, an Alltrax AXE. Um, you'll see it's, it's fairly easy to wire. Basically, there are three control wires here two to control how much uh, throttle response there is, and one as a safety switch. And then the, the big connectors are where you connect the motor and batteries. Uh, what is nice about this particular model is hidden behind this rubber gasket is a serial port. Uh, for those who uh, have some interest in doing telemetry, uh, you have access to the data provided to you by this motor controller. You can also program um, different acceleration and deceleration characteristics in this motor. That's what makes it programmable. This is great for kids that don't know how to drive their solar car quite yet. You can force a certain amount of acceleration so that if you start the car up and you just put the throttle all the way to max, as you shouldn't do, 
uh, it can then slowly ramp up the, uh, the energy output uh, to the motor, as opposed to just having a sharp spike and taking a lot of energy to accelerate. Uh, so those are always uh, interesting. Now, um, I would say that the better option to forcing a, a ramp up acceleration is just to train your drivers to be very light with the pedal during acceleration, and that will allow you that in the case of an emergency, if you really do need that acceleration to get out of the way of, a, of an accident, then, uh, then you don't have, you're not restricted. It's like, oh, where's my throttle response? To, you know, so uh, you might do that in training. I wouldn't do that uh, for real. Um, you know, just train your drivers to drive well. Okay, uh, brushless motors, uh, these are a few options for you. Uh, I will say that uh, I do have experience with this ME0907. It's, it's one of the most popular uh, brushless motors in this competition. Uh, and, and you can get that here. Um, it's just, uh, it's very efficient. It's, it's very reliable. Um, there's a very easy interface to do that uh, with the motor controller. And so uh, that's definitely a great option. Uh, finally, uh, with regard to uh, motors, is you have a choice of a hub motor. Uh, hub motors are essentially, so in, in the previous examples of the brush and brushless motors, you essentially have a spindle and you put a sprocket on that spindle to connect to your wheel and you have gear ratios and the like. In a hub motor, you have essentially a motor that's incorporated in the wheel, typically the rear wheel. And so because you don't have that conversion of, uh, of um, the, uh, the chain or a belt from the, sprock, uh, from the motor drive into a wheel, you get a lot more efficiencies. We're talking about you know, upper uh, 90%. I think they claim 99% efficient. Uh, I don't think anyone can really get up to that high of efficiency, but it's a very high efficient. And the, the problem with that is they're very expensive. Um, there are two examples up here. Um, there's a new generation motor, uh, hub motor. Uh, I, again, we've shared that NGM is not really in this business anymore, but you find teams that are getting rid of their old NGM motors and you might be able to score yourself one for less than $25,000, which is the retail price of it when they were selling it. Um, if you are interested in that, that gets you into the advanced division. So it's really something that experienced teams should be doing, not uh, first year teams. And I will say that the wiring for an NGM or any hub motor is significantly more complicated than that of a brushed or brushless motor. Uh, our team, well, uh, the Walnut team, we actually had the hub motor from the Indiana car in our shop for two years. We assigned one or two students to really, you know, play around with that. And eventually we just gave up and gave that motor to another team and we just couldn't figure it out. Um, and that's, they gave us all the wire harnesses and all that stuff, but we just couldn't get it running. So uh, just some caution there. It's, a, it's something that's nice to explore when you've been with the race for a while, you wanna try new things. That's definitely a, a way to go and I definitely don't discourage that. I just discourage that for uh, first year teams. Um, but because of MGM not uh, in business anymore, there is another company, uh, Mitsuba, that has taken over as the uh, preferred hub motor. Uh, many college teams use that. In our race, uh, Liberty Christian uses that. And I thought there was another team that might use that. Choctaw, Choctaw uses that. Yeah, and Tottenville has. So uh, there's, uh, teams that are, are using that cost is still about $25,000. So uh, you can build a whole classic division car for $25,000 for the price of one hub motor. So <clears throat> again, something to think about in the future. 
Okay. So we've taken you down the chain of getting the power from your solar array, converting it to charge your batteries, and then using your batteries to drive the motor. That's all what we call the propulsion or main electrical system side of things. Now let's uh, talk about both the main electrical and secondary electrical systems. Okay. Uh, the very first thing is we, in specifically in the rules, there are uh, the provisions for making sure that you use the appropriate wire uh, disconnect switches and fuses and, and the like for the electrical system. For the wire, we ask that you size your wire based off of your expected continuous current draw, right? You, you want to size your, your, your wire accordingly because if you undersize it, you have a risk of heating up your wire to the point in which it may potentially catch fire based off of the heat. So if you don't size it correctly, you, you may damage your car in that way. And so we will be asking you to give us certain calculations to say, I expect to be uh, drawing this amount of current and therefore we size the, uh, the wire for that size. I will say that if you are running a 48 volt car, I expect to be seeing something on the order of like number four welding cable as your main, you know, uh, wire for your, the, the wire for your main electrical system. If I start seeing, you know, eight gauge, 10 gauge, 12 gauge wire, I'm going to be asking you to do certain calculations, say, hey, is this sized accordingly? When you run at higher voltages, you can run at a lower gauge because you're, you're running less current through your system. Likewise, we ask you to put in disconnect switches and fuses to protect yourself. Uh, disconnect switches are used to ensure that if there is something wrong with the car, you have an easy way to disconnect your car. We have rules to have a set of switches to cut off your array. So if you have any issues with uh, charging, you can cut that off very quickly. And then we have another set of switches that are for the motor. So if you start having a runaway car or uh, your brakes don't work, things like that, you have an easy way to shut off the car. When I say a set of switches, it means that you have to have a switch accessible to the driver and you have to have a switch accessible from the outside because sometimes you may be testing your car and you may not have a driver in the car you need to be able to shut off your car from the outside. And we did have an incident in which we have a car run off and didn't quite shut off the, the, the disconnect in time and actually crashed into another vehicle. So uh, these are very important. We also ask that these be push-pull type so that you can very quickly run alongside a car and smack it and then it'll shut off. Uh, fuses are there in your system to protect your system in the case of a short or things like that. Um, as you run a whole bunch of cables in your car, uh, you may lay them out in a nice, neat way. And then you might think, oh, I forgot to install the rear view mirror in the car. And you start drilling holes in your frame to mount said uh, mirror. Well, if you sort of start tying your uh, wires to the frame and then you start drilling, sometimes you don't think about what you're doing and you might drill to the other side where the wires are at and cause a short onto the frame. We have specific rules that say that you can't ground to the frame, right? In, typic in typical automotive applications, you can ground to the frame, use the frame to bring the, the negative back. We don't allow this in our race because of this reason, that you may cause a short because of uh, basically drilling through something or, or other, other mechanical things you might do. Uh, fuses are there to protect you in case of a short so that those fuses blow, not your wire, not your components. And those fuses need to be appropriately sized for the current that you expect to run as well. So that's the main electrical system. 
uh, let's, let's move on to the secondary electrical system. I mentioned earlier that you can have the supplemental battery that drives all the remaining parts of your system. So uh, turn signals and, and tail lights for brakes, uh, fans for your driver and for your batteries, the horn, all those things. Telemetry might be something else. Anything not associated with driving your solar car can be powered by a supplemental battery. And that supplemental battery actually can be charged throughout the course of the race because it doesn't contribute to driving of the solar car. And so uh, that's why we say, hey, run all the other stuff through a supplemental battery system and you can just swap out your supplemental battery during the race. Um, so uh, electrical system layout. We do require, um, as part of your registration submission, that you give us a schematic. A schematic is used to show all the electrical components in the system and how they are connected. We have in the past gotten something like this. Drawn on a piece of paper, you can see a hand right there. <coughs> This is not allowed for registration. You must draw your schematic on some type of drawing program uh, so that we can very easily see it. So this is an appropriate example of a schematic that you can see, hey, I've got some solar panels, they're wired uh, a pair at a time to different power trackers. You can see how things are connected in a very simple way. Not only uh, do I like this because it is typed up and, and drawn on a computer, you look at this side, and this is more of what I would consider a wiring diagram. It shows you how the wires are laid out physically on your car. But it does not give you a very logical way of representing uh, how, your, your system is wire, uh, how your system is connected. Look, I have to go, if I need to see how the motor con controller is connected to the batteries, I have to follow this through here to this, and, and the negative is wired this way. You know, the, the lines are just all over the place. You know, why is this line going all the way to here? There's just a lot of um, details there. A wiring diagram is very useful for the team, don't get me wrong. We use the wiring diagram ourselves. And we actually put numbers and, and, and colors on that wiring diagram to tell us so that we, and we need to debug, we know which color wire things are. But that is not a schematic. We like seeing this because it's very easy to trace how the things are connected. Okay? Um, schematics shouldn't be difficult to do. Um, there are pieces of software that that will help you draw that. Um, they're just essentially boxes, lines. There are some standard symbols for a potentiometer, a battery, a, 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 a voltage converter. These all a switch. These things, these you know, symbols are part of the drawing tool. And so it's very easy to use. You saw yesterday in the Solid Edge presentation that they also support drawing of schematics in their software too. So it's available free to you. So you can go and download it and you can uh, get the schematic and they also allow you to physically lay out how the wires are connected uh, in the physical you know, layout and give you a wiring diagram as well and you can get wire links. So that's definitely another option for you to draw your schematics. And so uh, when you draw it out, design it, and everything, then you actually wire it up, and it looks a lot like this. So uh, what's neat about this system is a lot of things are localized to, um, to one location. Here are the power trackers. Here's the motor controller. The motor is you know, down here where the, where the rear wheel is. Here's a fuse. Um, here's a fuse block. Um, here was a, an old style uh, uh, motor disconnect. So you can see everything's very local, it's, it's done very neat. Um, 
you, there, you'll notice high voltage signs that's required by our rules to show, uh, to keep people away from uh, affecting your uh, electrical system. Okay. So that's how you wire up the, the, the car. Uh, we'll spend the, the rest of the time talking about batteries, but before we get there, are there any questions with regard to uh, power trackers, motors, controllers, uh, and wiring up of the electrical system? All right, cool. Question, yes? What is the motor? QS motor. QS? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's around like 300 levels. Oh, wow. And they are made for the motorcycles. It's also uh, for some parts of the motorcycles. Uh, and they are made for the motorcycles. Great. So that's another option for you, a hub motor from, from China called QS Motors. That's $300. A piece. Uh, what the, does what's the controller for that motor? Uh, we are using oh, Kelly controllers. Kelly okay. Controllers. So if you if you. Perfect. So if you are interested in exploring uh, hu other hub motors, that's definitely an option, and so you can and talk to him about that. Any other questions or comments? All right, let's talk about batteries. So uh, batteries, uh, there's a lot of considerations that you have to have for batteries. Um, the, the very first thing you have to consider is what your motor is. It's, it's sort of a funny thing to think about, but your motor really decides for you what system voltage you need to run at. Because motors are designed to run at a certain voltage. And so if I have a motor that runs at 48 volts, I have to have a battery pack that's sized for 48 volts. And so that's your very first consideration. What are you going to run as a motor? And so, therefore, what is your voltage for your system? The higher the voltage, the lower the current. So the higher the voltage that you run, the smaller wires that you have to run. Now you say, oh, why don't we just run at really high voltage? Well, we talked about the limitation of choices that you have in a motor controller. I sorry, in, in, in a power tracker. Your power trackers, if you go above 48 volts, you're going to have to then think about buying a more expensive AERL power tracker. And you also have more of an electrical risk, right? The higher the voltage, the more opportunity you have for electrical shock. In our rules, we provide recommendations for how to uh, deal with electrical, you know, when you're working on the electrical uh, components, we have certain guidelines for you to follow, like if you're going to be in a high voltage area, you work one hand with the other hand behind your back so that you're not able to shock yourself by connecting a current through uh, your two hands. Uh, so um, the, the higher that voltage is, the, the more chance that you have of getting that electrical shock. So there's, there's a safety consideration as well uh, for that. Okay. Um, once you've decided your voltage, you have a limited amount of uh, battery capacity that uh, you are allowed to have 5 kilowatt hours at a 20 hour discharge rate. We'll talk more about that in a second. But that's also going to consider the amount of weight and the amount of energy you can get at that weight. Uh, different battery t uh, technologies, different chemical uh, formulas will have different uh, weight energy densities. And so if you go lead acid batteries, if you go with flooded lead acid batteries versus AGMs versus, uh, you know, there, there are different considerations that you have to make with regard to that selection. Um, can your solar panels recharge the battery pack? 
That's a consideration for batteries and the selection of the power tracker because certain power trackers require you to boost up to your system voltage from your array. So your array is voltage is lower and it boosts up to your system voltage. Some of them are called buck, where you have a higher array voltage and you buck it down to your system voltage. And you have to, depending on the relative voltage of your array and your batteries, you have to purchase the appropriate power trackers. Is a road or track list? That's an interesting consideration for batteries because on a road race, you're going to uh, be braking and accelerating and braking and accelerating a lot more. In those scenarios, you have to consider, well, the more weight that I carry in the car, the more it's going to affect my acceleration. The more weight I have, the slower I will to accelerate, or the more energy it'll take for me to accelerate. On a track race, while you do have that type of, um, you know, if you brake and if you reaccelerate, you have that same mechanism, but you tend to get on the track and you cruise around at the same speed. And so you're, you have less acceleration. And so in those scenarios, aerodynamics play a much bigger role than the weight. It's just uh, relatively, I mean, weight still plays a factor. So that's some, some considerations that you have to have. Okay, so uh, I talked briefly about the five kilowatt hour rule, but what that means is um, your kilowatt hour, five kilowatt hours means 5,000 watt hours. And the idea is you take the amp hour rating of your battery and you multiply that by the voltage of the battery and you get your uh, capacity. So if you look at this, this is a Sun Extender PVX840T. Um, the numbering of that means that it is an 84 amp hour battery. And it is a 12 volt nominal battery. So that's the 12 volt, 84 amp hour. And let's say you run a 48 volt system. So that means you need four of these. So four 12 volt, 84 amp hour batteries is 84 amp hours at 48 volts or 4,032 watt hours. And so we calculate, we ask you to calculate that and limit your capacity to under five kilowatts. Uh, and just to note, this is a lead acid type of chemistry. This would weigh about 230 pounds. So it's something to consider is, do you want to maximize that five kilowatt hours so that you have the most capacity you could ever store at the cost of your weight? Or do you run at a lower weight and a lower capacity, even though you could have stored more? Something you have to consider. And we'll talk a little bit about strategies of that in our power management uh, module. Uh, some of the favorite uh, batteries of, of this uh, race, uh, of, of teams, I should say, we as a race never tell you you should use something, but teams tend to use uh, the Sun Extender series for lead acid batteries. And then uh, I haven't seen this as much nowadays, the, the Enersys Odyssey uh, uh, batteries. But you know, you, what you want to do, though, when you're looking at batteries is to look at uh, Pickard's number, which we'll get to uh, in later. And that will tell you how fast you can charge your battery based off of energy. Um, and we talked about uh, battery space as a, as a potential lithium battery uh, provider. OK, let's, let's talk about Pickard's number for a sec. Um, so if you look at lead acid batteries, um, you should be looking for something called the Pukert's number or the Pukert's exponent. The idea is that as you go along, a higher Pukert's number means that if you discharge your battery faster, you get significantly less usable capacity. So when you think about the battery capacity, we say, that battery that I showed in the picture has an 84 amp hour uh, capacity at a 20 hour discharge rate. 
That means that it's meant to run at 4.2 amps continuously for 20 hours in order to drain an entirely full battery pack. Great. If I want to run at 10 hours, what, is, what am I supposed to be able to run at? You go, okay, well, 4.2 at 20 hours, that means if I'm at 10 hours, I should be able to run at 8.4 amps, right? The math works that way, but the battery chemistries do not work that way. You have to discount a certain amount of battery capacity uh, based off of your discharge rate. And you'll see that in this graph here, right? So um, this graph is just done by the discharge rate instead of the time. But if you discharge a 200 amp hour battery at, you know, uh, at your discharge rate, the 20 hour discharge rate, which is closer to one hour or two hour, or two amps, sorry, one amp or two amps, if you discharge at 10 amps and you have a really bad pew curtain number, you only get half of the capacity, right? So if, you, if you're discharging from three amps to 10 amps, you only get 100 amp hours to play with instead of 200. And so the lower the pew curtain number, the less that effect sits there. So you want to find something that, um, that allows for a lower peak number so that you can discharge for more usable capacity. <clears throat> the peak number also is affected by the charging uh, time. It's basically the inverse of the discharge. The, the, the more current that you provide it, um, if you uh, provide it too much current, you have to, you have to discount that. Um, as you charge. And so again, the lower Pukert's number, the less effect that you have. So that's another consideration that you have to do. Okay. Testing. So batteries have a data sheet that promised you that you have a certain capacity at a, you know, a certain voltage. That's great and all, but Batteries are, are chemical reactions that are not the same for every battery. So it is critical that when you buy your batteries, that you test your batteries. Uh, what this is, is a rig that is essentially used to uh, discharge your battery in a very controlled way. They have uh, different mounts so that you can vary the, the discharge. So, you know, every lamp will, will discharge a certain amount of energy. And so what they do is they hook up a battery to the system. They have people jot down the, the voltages as you go down over time. You say, time this, this voltage, time this, this voltage, and so on. And you can get characteristics, a, a nice, you know, linear, hopefully linear progression of your voltage and say, this is how much capacity you have. You will notice when you do this that different batteries have different performance. And so if you don't do this, what you'll do is you'll randomly select a set of batteries that you've purchased, if you purchase more for spares, and then you will, you know, get whatever you, whatever randomly you chose, and you might be limiting yourself with uh, your, your capacity. Just like your solar cells, you wire your batteries in series, which means your battery pack is limited by the performance of the worst performing battery in your series. So if you do not do this test and choose the best battery set that you have, you are arbitrarily limiting yourself in the capacity that you're holding. You're essentially weighing yourself down with heavier batteries than you need. So you really need to, to take, a, take a, a, you know, type of test to this. Um, they recorded voltage, current, and amp hours. If you're able to do that with some instrumentation, which I definitely recommend for your vehicle as some way of tracking your, your voltage, your current, and your amp hour count, um, you can definitely use that during testing and also during the race. Okay, 
so that's all I have for batteries. Um, I, I will s make a statement before I move on that uh, lithium batteries is an option for advanced division teams. Uh, they have Pukert's number closer to 1.0. It's uh, that's why people like to use those. In addition, they have great energy density, which means that you get more capacity at lower weight. Um, however, uh, any team that gets into lithium, you know, ion lithium ion phosphate technologies must also consider the battery protection mechanisms that you have to have. You have to protect yourself against overcharging because you can spark a fire and lithium fires are no good. Uh, they basically are runaway fires. Um, you don't want to under, uh, you don't want to over discharge them because that'll ruin the capacity of the, of the lithium batteries. Um, there, there are temperature limitations and things like that. So really consider if you're going there to also get a lesson in battery protection mechanisms uh, before you approach that. But it's always something uh, interesting to play with, and we, we did that as well, and, and it, we, we were able to prove quite a bit of performance uh, because of that. These are things that you should consider later down the road, you know, two, three years down the road from a new car um, as things that you can optimize and expand later. Okay, uh, let's talk about lights. Uh, that, this has always been a um, controversial part, which shouldn't be very controversial at all. Um, we basically require stop lights and turn signals. You'll see in the rules that we require turn signals to be visible uh, at 30 meters, and we ask that stop, break, uh, stop lights or brake lights be visible at 100 meters. And these, the, the key thing uh, for you at this point in time is to source something that is um, very visible and to mount the lights in a way that is visible. A lot of teams may decide to get these really thin LED lights and then they, they aim it in, in a direction where, you know, if you use LEDs, they're very directional. And if you aim them slightly down, that's where they're aiming. And so you really can't see it from straight back. The point of these lights is that a a car following behind you, uh, be it the chase vehicle or some other vehicle, that driver needs to be able to see it. So they're usually sitting higher, not lower than the solar car. So that solar car really needs to have uh, lights that are mounted uh, appropriately. Um, you know, you can buy LED lights. There, there are different uh, options that you have there. Um, and of course, uh, there's also a mention of echo lights. This is for road races, for support vehicles. We do require certain model echo lights because they're very bright to see. And so that's a place that you might get it. Okay. Switches and fuses, we talked slightly about this, but I want to go more into details about this. Um, we require push-pull disconnects for the motor and the array. Um, they're essentially right now uh, one particular vendor that supports the wide range of voltage and current that we expect during this race. And it's the Albright uh, disconnect. It looks like this. Um, there are two models of it. There's a, there's a regular version, uh, ED250, and a ED250B. The B is really good for the high voltage applications. If you need a you know, 48 volt or something like that, you can get the regular ED250. These disconnects need to be rated for DC. It is much harder to break a DC uh, current than an AC current, because an AC current sort of is a sine wave around zero, and so there's easy to break those uh, those currents. And you'll see a lot of disconnects rated for very high AC voltage. The problem with that is you're running DC. And so you need to get a disconnect that's rated for DC. The same thing applies for fuses. Your fuses need to be rated for DC as well. So a lot of people, you can see these type of fuses, this about the size, and you can imagine that that's you know, something like a 3 8 bolt, so it gives you a relative size there. 
Um, and so you can, you can get the right voltage and current rating for, for fuses. And so there's some references here to uh, a source for those. Okay. So that's the electrical portion of, of the uh, presentation. Are there any questions that you have? All right. At this point, I think we're going to take a lunch, that correct? So we will be. Oh, question, sorry. Okay. Okay. Hey, Sam. Can you hear me? If I'm using a motorcycle tire, do I have to keep it at the uh, advised pressure of the tire? Yes. Or can I over pressurize the tire? That's correct. Uh, you, you, there, there is a, a provision for inflating your tires to the regular, the, the spec uh, air pressure. The, so whatever's on the sidewall. Okay. <laughs>